Good evening and welcome to the Directors Guild of America. Uh, tonight, we proudly present our first in the Game Changer series of events celebrating our 75th anniversary here at the DGA. Tonight, we're focusing on films that have been not necessarily blockbusters, but films that actually change the way people think about this medium. How a kid from a small farming community in the San Joaquin Valley became the transformative visionary for several generations of filmmakers is a fascinating story. But before we begin, I'd like to turn the stage over to Michael Apted, the chairman of our 75th anniversary. Michael. So to discuss these influences with George, we wanted to find someone from that next generation of filmmakers that George has influenced. And I'm, I'm proud to welcome Christopher Nolan, who in a short few years and seven movies has established himself as a young giant of modern cinema. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome George Lucas and Christopher Nolan. So much has been in, written and, and talked about about Star Wars. Um, uh, we're not going to worry about any spoilers here. I'm just going to assume that everybody in the crowd knows what happens at the end of the film. <laughs> but for people of my age, and you know, I'm 40, there are movies before Star Wars and then there's Star Wars and, and it changed absolutely everything for us since. What was around at the time that made you think that there was some context for this? To be very honest, there was no context other than 2001, which was really science fiction. Mm. And Kubrick did that, you know, uh, sort of first quality, enough time, enough money to do it however he wanted. And, and uh, he was a genius. And, you know, I didn't think that anybody was going to make a better science fiction film than that. So I sort of went and began to focus on uh, space opera, which wasn't really space opera. What I'd done is I'd gone through um, uh, I'd love Saturday Night Night Serials when I was a kid. They were on television. These sort of all-out action picture. You know, it had a cliffhanger after 15 minutes, and then, they, you know, each, show, each one was 15 minutes long, and then it was a serialized thing. And I really wanted to do something in that genre. Well, the original impetus was being an angry young college student. I did THX, and THX is based on the fact that if you tell people we live in a miserable world, this is a parable about the way we live, and we're all um, screwed up, the country's screwed up, our society is screwed up, uh, that people will jump up and uh, throw down the tyrants. Well, obviously it didn't happen. Nobody went to see the movie. So, <laughs> so that didn't have much of an effect on anybody. American Graffiti was really done as a bet with, Je with uh, Francis, uh, who we had, because of THX, uh, American Zotrope went bankrupt. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we were all forced to go out and get real jobs. And, um, well, Francis was anyway, because I couldn't get a real job, because uh, I, I was just a film student. Uh, and I'd made one movie that was, you know, basically a hopeless, you know, weird thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, so he went off to do The Godfather, and uh, he said, I dare you to go out and make something completely different, you know, something, a, a comedy. Do a comedy. No more robots, no more of this cool, artistic BS. Do something that's just, just a thing. Well, as close as I could get to that was this film about my wasted youth. And the only thing that really excited me about was the music track. And so, you know, I had crazy ideas about how I wanted to put this together and make it one night and tell all these characters and everything. So the studios all said, well, this is too weird. It's too much, ex it's too experimental. It's not going to work. It's you know, we don't want it. So years and years went by trying to sell this damn thing. Finally, Francis got done with The Godfather and came back and said, well, I'll put my name on it and that'll sell it, which is the way it got made. And then when it got finished, the studio wouldn't release it. They said it was terrible, it's incomprehensible, it wasn't fit to show an audience. Maybe we'll put it on as a movie of the week, but we're certainly not going to release it. Before that, I had this idea of doing a kind of space opera. I actually had two films that were very much the same. One was about an archaeologist, which was a Saturday Night Night Serial, and the other one was a space opera. And I had picked the space opera because I wanted to take, um, I'd started out in college as an anthropologist, and I'd always wanted to 
take mythology and take the psychological underpinnings of, and motifs of, of mythology from all around the world and boil it down into things that seem to resonate everywhere in the world. And I said, I can take that concept of the psychological underpinnings of mythology, combine it with the exciting action adventure of a Saturday matinee serial, and that would be kind of a cool movie. And so I went to Flash Gordon rather than Don Winslow of the Navy or all these other things. And I, um, when I went to get a deal for American Graffiti, which I couldn't, and I said, uh, I finally got David Pickard, United Artists, to say, well, okay, well, we'll fi finance this script. Um, I mean, I do have the advantage of being a writer, so, and you do too, but it's like, to me, it's like, okay, I can just, you know, so they paid me the giant sum of $10,000 to write a screenplay. When I wrote it, they said, we don't want it. I took it around to everybody. Nobody wanted it. And finally, I say, when Francis attached his name to it, I got it done at Universal. But it was a real struggle, and I didn't get paid much. So by the time I finished that, I was ready for a job because right. <laughs> uh, I had no money whatsoever. So the primary thing was to actually make some money so I could get a thing. So I had this other project. The other thing about Marin Graffiti was that I finished it like in February. The studio wouldn't release it. They said it was terrible. So what we did was every time somebody from the studio, the TV department to see if they could put it in television, uh, the marketing department to see if they could figure out a way of, you know, of marketing okay. it, uh, everybody, whenever they'd have a screening at Universal, instead of letting them, the three executives, sit in a little room, they got little rooms there, you'd seat about 12 people. We said, no, 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 no. And we put them in a room this size. And we invited everybody at the studio, anybody who had friends, anybody, anybody to see it. So everybody, they always saw it with a full house. Mm. And of course, right. the screenings we'd had were all you know, sensational. Everybody just went screaming, yelling, went crazy. Well, yeah, because if anyone doesn't know, it's not actually a terrible movie. Right? It's, a <laughs> it's actually a but, very good movie. But it, so Al Nadd Jr. was one of the, he, he got invited to this. He was the mm -hmm. head of production over at Fox. He saw it and he was one of the most um, logical and visionary studio executives I've ever met. And he simply said, look, I love that movie. And he said, what do you got? Well, I got a thing. Of course, when I'd gone and made the deal with David Pickard to do American Graffiti, he said, what else do you got? I said, well, I got this kind of space opera thing. Uh, I called Star Wars. He said, well, we'll take that too. And of course, so then it was at, at United Artists. Of course, then when I went to get American Graffiti, I did it at Universal. They said, well, okay, we're gonna make up a three picture deal. We'd make more, but we don't think that legally we can get away with more, so we'll just take three pictures from you. <laughs> the seven years of your life. So he said, I don't understand what you're talking about, uh, <laughs> but I think you're talented, so whatever you wanna do is fine with me. Now, how many times have you ever heard that? Uh, you know, I trust the talent, not the script. Mm. I mean, it's just, those were the days. They weren't really, but there was a, there was a little thin thread of rationality that came through the film industry in the 70s, really. I mean, it was amazing. And everybody talks about how it happened, but mostly it was because all the moguls had died off. The corporations bought the studios and everything was in chaos. Mm. So you had odd people being hired to, to run things and they didn't know about power yet and all that kind of stuff because they weren't getting stock options. So it was like an amazing little time. To make a long story even longer, uh, <laughs> That was the context in which I actually started writing the film. It took me two right. years of research with basically mythology and a lot of things. I had taken a lot of mythology when I was in college because of my major. So I distilled it down, wrote a script. I wrote a giant script. The original film was basically subtitled The Tragedy of Darth Vader. And in the beginning, Darth Vader comes in and kills everybody. And in the middle, you find out that this kid is actually the son of Darth Vader. And in the end, the son validates, vindicates, and allows the father to be. Um, so that was the movie. But of course, I wrote it, it was like 250 pages. <laughs> and so I said, well, this ain't going to happen. So even before I turned it into Fox. As I, I say, did you ever show them that? I never showed them that. Right. I, I knew enough to know. <laughs> Look, the budget, the budget of the film at that point was $3 million. Wow. So I knew that that wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I'll take the first act and I'll make that into a movie, but I swear I will make the other two movies. I'll make this whole thing. Mm. I accidentally opened a hornet's nest, but I am actually gonna see it all the way through to the end. I mean, I was sitting there writing this with one movie that made, you know, less than 
three or four hundred thousand dollars. Another movie that was so bad that it wouldn't even be released. And so I was struggling away um, writing the screenplay because I was getting paid more actually to write that screenplay than I got to do everything on American Graffiti. And so um, what did they say when you gave them the script then? When you had your first they gave, I gave them the script. Laddie said, look, I don't understand this. Dogs <laughs> flying spaceships? What are you talking about? This is ridiculous. <laughs> but you're a really talented guy. Go ahead and make it. Yeah. <laughs> and then we literally we, no, no notes? None of the no notes. studio I would, notes? I got very lucky. I came out of film school, Francis and I moved to San Francisco. We never really got involved with the studio system at all. Francis mm. had been involved and he said, this is enough after Finney and Rainbow, he said, I'm never doing this again. And then after I sort of sunk American Zoetrope, he had to come back and work for <laughs> Paramount <laughs> to do Godfather, which was really, to be honest with you, one of the most horrific experiences that I've ever seen a director go through in terms of, you know, people trying to, you know, getting kicked off the picture all right. the time, right. studio executives that were just involved in everything. He had to fight every single day. You know, they hated the cast, they hated the music, they hated the story, they, everything he did, they hated. Mm. And so he was fighting this huge uphill battle, and it took a while. While he did that, I wrote Star Wars, and then when I turned it in, they uh, said they didn't understand it, but, and I said, well, you know, the budget, we started putting it together and figuring out where we're and how we were gonna do it and everything. Mm -hmm. The one thing they were worried about was the fact that this involved a lot of special effects, and there were no special effects departments at the studios anymore. Mm -hmm. There were some map painters. There were exactly three map painters in the world. <laughs> and that was it, and they were all, you know, in their 60s and 70s. And Kubrick had built his own unit, mm. which then turned around and disbanded when he finished. And Doug Trumbull was one of those guys, and he started a little production company that did a lot of commercials and did, you know, and he was trying to get his own little science fiction movie off, but there just wasn't any special effects. So the studio was saying, well, how are you gonna make this? When I did uh, THX, the studio asked me the same thing. Well, this is a big science fiction film. How in the world are you gonna do this? You know, what are you gonna, what takes, so I came up with a thing called rotary cam photography. I said, I'm gonna do it with rotary cam photography. It's very new, it's gonna be special, it'll make it look great. That's so I, I took that idea and I told Fox, I said, don't worry, I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I started out in film school as an animator, so I knew a little bit about this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I said, you know, we'll, we'll do it. So I took all of the, the uh, money I'd made on American Graffiti and I invested in a special effects company, ILM, and uh, hired all these guys. One was a cameraman that worked for Doug Trum Trumbull, uh, John Dykstra, and a bunch of guys that did commercials and did, you know, none of them had ever really made a feature film before. Hmm. They, you know, and none of them had actually done real special effects except on commercials. So you had to do that with your own money outside the budget of the film, or? Well, I used it to start the company. Right. And then obviously ended up building it back to the, the effects right. back to the studio. But, That's the but way. Francis taught me how to do that. Absolutely. <laughs> he said, the first thing you do when you start a movie is you buy a camera. <laughs> and then you rent the camera back to the company. Now, unfortunately, all the cameramen have learned this trick and yeah. the sound men. And oh, practically yeah. everybody has learned it. So you're going to find when you hire somebody, they're going to be, you're going to be buying, you're going to be renting all the equipment from the people who are making more money renting you the equipment than they get paid. So in terms of how you explained to them what you were going to do, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is uh, one of the techniques that's become extremely common for, for directors showing the studio what the film is going to be is conceptual artwork, paintings, that kind of thing. Yes. My understanding is, you know, when you found Ralph McQuarrie and you had him do his paintings, I mean, I don't think anyone had really done that before. So my well, question would be, well, what... Yeah, I, I, it had been done before. It had done in the studios. They had done it, like, on Gone with the Wind and stuff. Uh -huh. William Cameron, Cameron Menzies had done paintings of what the special effect shots were going to look like and what the grandeur, mm -hmm. the big scenes, he painted the big scenes. So it, was a, a, it wasn't unheard of. Uh, but again, I had to do it out of my own money. I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't right. get paid that much. And I had a little company that basically just represented me. I developed my own little uh, mixing room. I had my own editing room. I had, you know, but it was all in San Francisco and it was all real funky. We did show them that. The one thing that we did break through on that film is I had all these really big action set pieces. I couldn't really explain what I wanted to do with storyboards. Because mm -hmm. I didn't really believe in storyboards because 
Storyboards are great if you're doing map paintings, if they're static, and you say, well, this was the shot, and sometimes in animation back in those days, you know, it was just everything was on a proscenium. So you just did it and you painted the picture and say that's what it is. You didn't have to do extremely complex things. So what I did on Star Wars is I took a lot of old documentary films of air battles from World War II and I cut them into the sequences of this is going to be the trench run. This is going to be the attack on the Before you shot Death Star. Anything. Before I shot anything. Before I even finished the script. Wow. When I started film school, I was a dyed in the wool cinematic purist. I said, and I went to school, and they, you know, I had to go into screenwriting, and I got into huge fights in the middle of classes with the screen with the screenwriting professor, saying, you know, character is bullshit. You know, story doesn't mean anything. This that's for the that's for the theater. That's for that's for books. That's not for cinema. Cinema is the art of the moving image. You know, you are eviscerating this whole art form with your kind of reproducing other mediums and other art forms. So I was really not a real fan of writing, which is ironic that mostly what I do now is write. But uh, so when it got to that part of it, I knew that I couldn't write what I wanted. Mm. And I knew still drawings couldn't tell me what I wanted because I had to do it in terms of motion. And I knew that the secret behind what I was doing in terms of visual effects by that time, the one thing I grabbed onto was that as opposed to Stanley Kubrick, who has got you know, one two minute shots in his film, where the, the thing just sits there and the ship sort of slowly <laughs> cruises, it. but you can see every detail on that and it's mm. perfect. So I said, I'm not gonna do that. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do shots that are only about you know, 12 frames, 32 frames at the most, and it'll move by so fast that you won't see the matte lines. <laughs> and you won't see, uh, you know, how it's put together. It'll just be a razzle-dazzle of visual uh, fantasy. Well, let me ask, because one of my, I, I asked my, my boys, you know, whether they had any questions for you, and one of the questions was, how do you do the spaceships flying and, and all the rest? And I thought, well, it's, it's the obvious question after you watch Star Wars, because for, for those of us seeing it for the first time as kids, it was completely mind-blowing and, and exciting. And, and I guess, did you have any films you could point to, other than 2001 with this extremely slow through the frame motion. Well, you you know, being from film school, I, I you know, uh, and I was a big Kurosawa fan. Mm. So I would say Seven, Seven Samurai had actually more of an effect, even though the idea of telling the story from the point of view of the lowliest servants came from Hidden Fortress, but mm. the actual, there were, there were, you know, bullet. I mean, there were a lot yeah. of movies from that period. That was a movie that was at that period. Mm. That was very exciting, very fast, mm. you know, very... And so I had become obsessed with the kinetic nature of film. Mm. And most of my student films were very kinetic. There mm. a lot of very fast cutting and that sort of thing. And I went on really to be an editor, and I started working as an editor. So my whole focus was on editing. Mm. And um, so uh, I figured I'd just trick everybody. Uh, and we would make this really fast stuff, and if a shot didn't work or something, we'd just put a big boom there, and they'd blink their eyes, and it would go away. <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, you, could, you could fake it, which is what basically I did in the end. And we had, to, in order to do that, we also had, we had no technology to do what we were doing. And so I had started as an animator. I really started as a cameraman, then I, when I went to film school, I started as an animator. And we came up with this idea of basically taking an animation stand and hooking it on rails and on a camera and putting the model there and using it just like an animation stand. Mm. But an animation stand relies on precision, precisionally machined parts so that everything is exactly the same. So it really became a, a thing of, uh, of metalworking and you know, right. making a, pre a precision thing that would move down a track and you could repeat the same move every time. Uh, and l also link it to computers, which was the first time we sort of, they were just starting to put computers on animation cameras. And mm. so we just said, well, we'll just do it that way. And without that, we could never have done it. Because when it literally was, a, it was like, it was like 800 very, very short shots. Right. And it was basically a model on a stick with the camera moving past it, and then doing the same thing on the star field, and then matching those things together. So even though it's really simple now, it was a big, head scratcher at the time. Yeah. And everything depended on it. You know, I was, I mean, there's 
you know, the, the, the inevitable reality that you get. It doesn't happen that much anymore. I mean, it does, of course, some people don't use ILM, but some <laughs> people, you come, and I had this horrendous, you know, see what was it like and everything. Well, it was unbelievably miserable, mm. which American Graffiti was unbelievably miserable. THX was fun. Um, <laughs> but as soon as I, you know, I started getting bigger and I started pushing the envelope, I started getting myself into real trouble. Mm. When you're in real trouble, then you're in miserable all day. Even though the studios never bothered me. I never had a problem until I showed the film. Well, then the studio what, said, we gotta, we got to cut five minutes out of I this. I was going to say, well, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, but, I, that, I, but on this one, it was, it was literally that I came back from shooting, having mm -hmm. a miserable experience, and ILM hadn't shot one shot. They had spent half the budget. It was six months later. We only had six months to go before the film was going to be released. We had 800 shots, yeah. and there wasn't one that I had accepted. Wow. And I was... Slightly thought, tense situation. I thought this was not going to work. Right. I had walked out and stood up and realized that I'd painted myself in a corner and I didn't know what to do. So all of the ILM stuff got put into place as you were going into production or even before? Yeah, as soon as I started writing and as soon as they said, okay, we, you know, they accepted the script. So as soon as I started pre-production, I started ILM. So mm -hmm. they were working, and right. we had to build the whole thing, and we had to build the cameras from scratch, and we had to build, yeah. you know, and I'd hired a couple of those guys before that just to start figuring out the technology, how we would do it. And I had Ralph McQuarrie doing drawings of what I wanted everything to look like because, again, you can't read the script and understand what I'm talking about. Mm. It has to be a picture because just, I mean, what does a Wookiee look like? What, does a spa what do the spaceships look like? Yeah. All that stuff had to be figured out ahead of time. There was... Uh, a lot of design work that had to be done, but also I deliberately wrote Star Wars to be within the realm of technology mm. and within the realm of how I could make it re at a reasonable price. So I was pushing the envelope with one thing, which is how to make spaceships move fast in the space and pan with them, yeah. because I was really obsessed with the kinetic energy of a pan. Mm -hmm. And I said, if I could just put a pan in a spaceship, it'll really make this thing jump. But obviously it was, at that point, impossible. So mm -hmm. that I had to accomplish. But everything else I knew I could do. And it's designed for no costumes, for no costume changes. Mm -hmm. for, there's a lot of tricks in that movie right. that are done, you know, so, I, so, you know, to cut costs way down. And I wrote it with all that stuff in mind. So that it was like, oh, yeah, we can... You know, I'll save on costumes by doing this. And, it really uh, doesn't play like a movie that somebody's decided to shrink their vision. Yeah, but if you look at it, that's, <laughs> you, you think of it, when you really look at the, the thing, yeah. it really is, it takes place in the desert, and it okay. takes place on a Death Star. That's it. You know, and, and it's like real easy. Well, then here's what, okay. <laughs> here's my question then. If, given that pragmatism, given that, okay, now we're going to go make this film or whatever, you've got a desert, you've got a Death Star. Why did you start in the desert? Like, why did you, the first time I think C-3PO put his costume on, you're in the middle of 110 degree heat in Tunisia. I mean, it just seems a very, very difficult way to start. Come on, we're, we're movie directors. We're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> when have you ever thought of a movie director that has enough common sense to get out of the rain or the heat? <laughs> I mean, all crews know that. You know, my movie is everything. Yeah. You know, but I'm, guys are dying out here, for God's sake. Uh, well, the things I wanted to do, I wanted it to be shot on location. Mm -hmm. I, put it, I tried to find an environment that I could make look spacey and unreal, and I decided a desert would be a good thing, that I could actually shoot on location so it looked realistic, because I was very keen to have, it, have a, a, a patina of immaculate realism, mm. which, is, um, which is something I learned from, the, from Kurosawa, which was to say, even though this is a ridiculous story, and it's obviously, it has no reality in it whatsoever. I wanted to make a world that looked like it had been lived in, mm -hmm. that had logic on every level, that every cultural artifact, every uh, set piece had a reason for being there. It wasn't just sort of willy-nilly. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, obviously, everything had to be designed. And of course, a lot of it in that one was sort of designed around things we could get our hold of mm -hmm. and find. So a lot of, there was a lot of found design. You know, we were using uh, you know, things like egg beaters for ray guns and stuff like that. So there's a lot of cheating going on in that movie. I there's mean, a lot, of, a lot of texture. There's a lot of, 
I mean, I remember when the, the droids are first in the, in the sand crawler and you see that, that dark, greasy, sort of worn away right. stuff. A, a lot of filmmakers, I mean, Ridley Scott, I've read about you know, him talking about how much he was influenced by that when he then went to do Alien and Blade Runner. Just the idea, and it, it seems in retrospect a simple idea, that things would age in science yeah. fiction as opposed to being perfect. But I don't think it had ever been done before. I don't, it, I'm pretty sure it hadn't. It was pretty mm. shocking when I did it because you know, everybody thought space, uh, you know, science fiction, it's all clean and perfect. Yeah. You know? But even when I did THX, it was used and dirty and there was water running marks down the walls and all kinds of details, robots that didn't work. Mm. You know, for whatever reason, my relationship with technology has always been a little bit, I mean, I started out building cars, so it all comes from the, from yeah. the point of view of working in a, in a car, in a, in a garage, mm. where you, build, you work on broken cars, and I tell my son how lucky he is now, but in those days, when you drove, you know, to the next town, you know, if I, I mean, lived in Modesto, if I drove to San Francisco, there was a pretty much like a 25% chance that you wouldn't make it, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that the car would break somewhere along the line, or you get a flat tire, but you just basically wouldn't get there. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to stop and call 3A or fix the car yourself or do whatever. But now, you know, cars are almost invincible, you know. <laughs> but in those days, cars were sort of like computers are today, where, you know, they don't always do what you're telling them to do. So did the whole, the, did the crew, you know, John Barry, the, the designer and all this, did they embrace that philosophy? Did you have to convince them? Was the John Barry and the art department, John Barry was a really fantastic art director, really, really great guy. He put together an art department prop guys, you know, the whole little group. They were completely and 100% on my side yeah. and very, very supportive of me in every possible way. And no matter how wacky I got, they would go along with it and they came up with other things. You know, they, they actually contributed a lot mm. by bringing things in, even, you know, because again, it's one of those things where the design work in Star Wars, and especially as it goes on to all the other ones, is huge. I mean, it's mm. beyond anything that anybody can imagine. It takes at least three years and seven or eight guys now, I mean, I have a permanent design department that just does nothing but design stuff. We had to do that much work and while I was writing the script, I had the designers working designing stuff. Even when I was, that was the first people I put on, was like Ralph McQuarrie and then we put on more guys, uh, Joe Johnston and a few people and I had designers working the whole time I was writing the script mm -hmm. for those two years. And that's why you never see it. You know, it's like, yeah, maybe Lord of the Rings, but we kind of know there's forests and whatnot. But there, it's very, there are very few movies that involve the level of design work mm. that something like Star Wars does because there's nothing in it to relate to. Mm. You know, you can't yeah, say, well, everything. we'll work on these three little things, and this is a car, and this is a building, and this is a boat. Mm. Well, you know what those are. You know, this is a fork. Mm -hmm. You know what that is, yeah. uh, and you can just sort of figure it out. But with this, you, everything was open. The cultures were open. The people, the aliens were open. That was a very hard part of it. But the, that film is as much visually done, and as much visual work as written work. Well, and even though uh, you know you're saying there are very few costume changes, and that was restrained. The, the costumes are extraordinary in the film. I mean, Darth Vader, the stormtroopers. I mean, there are so many iconic things there. How much of that came from original, the original conceptual work where you wrote the script? How much was John Mollow, you know, in the normal pre-production phase when you're there sort of trying to do well, fittings and things? Yeah. What usually happens in this case, and it happened in that case too, is I work with the designers and we just design uh, what we want or what I want. Mm -hmm. And I just go, no, make it like this, make it like, combine those two things, go like this, and I get a design that I like. Mm. And so that's where the designs basically came from. Then I turn it over to the... Uh, costume designer, which is um, somebody like John Marlowe, and I say, Marlo, I say okay, now make these. Mm. Figure out how to do that. And in that case, it was make it for no money. Yeah. So it was very hard, uh, and we were constantly sort of, you know, finessing things to make it look like what the drawings were. And how did they make the Stormtrooper costumes? Are they molded plastic? They're molded plastic. Molded that was, again, John Barry, who, and again, th some of this stuff is like really new Mm. You know, molding plastic, yeah. you know, was like a new thing. Vacuum forming. Right. Getting a vacuum form ma machine was like a big deal. <laughs> you know, we got like the only one in England. We did, mm -hmm. It was, came from some, I don't know what factory, but we just grabbed it. And we also did uh, 
uh, another kind of vacuum forming, which in John designed the sets. I mean, Ralph kind of designed what they look like, but then John took those designs and made them into panels. Mm. So he made uh, four by eight panels, which is kind of like sheets of plywood, mm -hmm. and they were, you know, they were uh, made out of some kind of fiberglass mold thing that he that they had created. But they, and they, but they were vacuum formed, and you know they had all this work on them, you know, depth and things because they were about that thick. Mm -hmm. But there was just basically a piece of molded fiberglass, really. And he built all the sets out of this stuff. Mm -hmm. It was just he he just made thousands of them. And they build a set, they just say, okay, and they put up a little wood frame and they nail this stuff to it, and we build a set. It was amazing. But you really had to think that way. Even the, even the spaceships were done that way. You know, the, the opening spaceship is all vacuum formed. Mm. You know, it's all, it's, it was a whole different approach to building sets. Yeah. And that was one of the ways we got it done. You know, really was by figuring out new ways to accomplish things and new, uh, you know, just operational things that we could get away with so we didn't have to spend. And the whole thing depended on, as I said, look, I'm going to pan around so I'll never see this stuff. Mm. So just, you know, build it to stand up for a minute right. and we'll shoot it. <laughs> and uh, if it doesn't look that good, we'll just throw it out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that was definitely, that, the, the irony of that movie was it was designed to be seen once on a big screen. And that way I could get away with everything. I had no idea there would be things called DVDs. I had no idea there would be, you know. I don't think it's even DVDs. I mean, I, I saw Star Wars in the movie theater 12 times. Yeah. And I would, there was nothing unusual about that. I mean, when it came out, every birthday party for two years, you all went to see Star Wars. You know, that was just, I mean, literally. Um, but well, to there, ask, I'll say, there was one thing which is also part of it was that I made it a very rich environment, a very rich yeah. frame. There's very a dense. lot of detail in a frame, mm -hmm. a lot of busy stuff. And uh, by doing that, one, it's distracting. But <laughs> I, I did it because I said, look, I'm going to assume that we've been here. Mm. This is just like you know, shooting Batman. Mm. You, know, you know what New York looks like. It sort of looks like Gotham. Gotham looks like, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. okay, fine cars, whatever. We've been there before we knew what this was like. So I didn't stop for anything. Mm. And I didn't hold on my map paintings. Right. You know, I, I said, uh, you know, Death Star. We've all seen a Death Star. There's a Death Star. You don't have to, you don't have to linger on it. Yeah. We would just, yeah. as if it were the Empire State Building. You know, just, okay, fine. But they used to, you know, a map painting costs so much money that it's inevitable the studio and the director and everybody wants to put it on there for a long time. Mm. Say, look, this really costs a lot of money. We're going to show you how great yeah. we are. And I said, no, 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 no. And everybody went crazy. Mm. And I said, you put all that money in a map painting and you literally let it be on there for 32 seconds, I mean 32 frames? Mm. That's crazy. <laughs> but it works because yeah. that's why a lot of people went back and because they couldn't get it all the first time. Everybody said, my gosh, that's so fast. The pace is so fast. Mm. You can't, you know, if you look at that movie, well, you're going to see it tonight. It's not fast. <laughs> in those days, it was so fast. And it was fast because you didn't know what anything was. Right. So you were busy trying to take so it all in, in, and yeah. you didn't have time to do it. Now, you do know what all that stuff is. You're very right. familiar with it. You grew up with it, just like the Empire State Building. So the movie has got a normal kind of, I wouldn't say lack of a physical pace, but no. it's a normal pace of a movie. Well, I think it's partly because movies have changed since it. I mean, I think the editing rhythms have been greatly influenced by it. And, and people having more faith in audiences being able to take in things very quickly with, with quick cuts. But I wanted to just, just go back to costumes for a second because one of the things, one of the other questions I was asked by my voice to ask you is, <laughs> is, is Darth Vader half human, half robot? And that made me think about, okay, the first time you come to see Star Wars in 1977, how is it that we know that C-3PO is a robot, Stormtrooper is a human being, and Darth Vader is whatever he is? Um, they're all, you know, actors, performers in, you know, molded suits, right. molded, and the, the film never, in any way, sort of attempts to explain anything. Somebody's a robot, somebody's not. No. So, so how is it we, we know that? And how did you have the confidence that audiences would just figure that out? Again, part of this also comes from Kurosawa, yeah. which is when I first saw Seven Samurai, it was in film school. I, you know, I come from a very small town in the middle of California. I'd never seen a Japanese film, a foreign film, for that matter. 
And I wasn't interested in movies. You know, I got, like, sort of fell into film when I got to film school. I didn't even know there was such a thing as going to college to learn how to make movies. I mean, that seemed like completely absurd to me. Uh, but <laughs> the idea of being an anthropology professor, I was interested in thing, but I was more, wanted to go to art center and be an illustrator or something. But this, like, combined all that stuff. I love photography. So I said, okay, I'll do that. The Kurosawa thing is I saw Kurosawa films mm. there for the first time. My friend John Milius was a Kurosawa freak. And he would, and he showed me a lot of Kurosawa films, and I saw Seven Samurai. And that was the first j feudal Japanese film I'd ever seen. Mm. So I had no idea what I was looking at. I mean, it was completely incomprehensible to me. I just had never seen that period of Japan in my life. I missed that. And so I was sitting there saying, what in the hell is going on? Who are these people? And what, why are they doing them? They're talking about all kinds of things. I w didn't have any idea what they were talking. I mean, it was in Japanese, but at the same time, even in English, it didn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, because there were all these, you know, traditions and things that I just, mm -hmm. you know, and I said, this is so fascinating just on the watching a strange culture that you'd have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. Just the fascinating part of it. Uh, which is probably the anthropology part, which is to go strange places and watch people, you know, indigenous people do strange things you don't know what it is and why. Mm. So I decided to take that concept and put it into Star Wars. I said, hey, I could watch Seven Summer. I didn't know what I was looking at, but I enjoyed it, mm. even though I didn't know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So I said this, you know, and I will give enough clues to, you know, mm -hmm. make it obvious. You know, if you saw the whole three movies all put together in one piece and it was only two hours, a lot of that would make sense because everything would be revealed. Mm -hmm. But because it took nine years to do it, when the people first saw Darth Vader, they didn't know what he was. They, is he a monster? Is there a guy in there? Is it a robot? Is a, they didn't know who he was. He was just the villain. Mm. He was the villain. And he was such an iconic villain, which again, you know, at the time I didn't have any idea that any of this would work or <laughs> that it would have the impact that it did. You just don't think that way. Mm. Um, you just do your best job and it comes out and that, more than anything, uh, in the end, made me do the first three movies. Mm. Because I had this whole backstory, because I wanted to start with episode four, because I wanted to be like a serial. You come in, you hadn't seen the first. Again, same idea. Mm. You're coming in, it was like a television series, and you're like 24. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what happened before. I don't, I don't, what's going on? Who are these people? And you know, If you don't come in in the first episode, you come in in the fifth episode. Right. Uh, so I wanted that kind of throw you right into the middle of something you don't have any idea about. Mm -hmm. But then later on I realized that the tragedy got lost in that and if I told the backstory, which was obviously written before the, mm -hmm. the actual film, uh, that it would make more sense. You know, you start wow. out as a nice little kid and he actually went as a nice guy and he would turn bad. When you shot the whole film uh, in England in the stages there, what, what led you to England? I said, well, I would like to make one big movie you know, you shoot on sound stages, like a real movie. Because yeah. I was a guy that shot on the street for, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars, and that's where I was. And, and I said, well, I'm going to go back to doing these abstract art films. But before I do that, I'd like to, I sort of got myself wrapped into this, you know, regular traditional movie thing. I want a scholarship to go work at Warner Brothers for six months, you know, as an observer. Mm -hmm. I said, eh, I'll never work here, but I'll just, let, I should see what it's all about, this Hollywood thing. And then I got mixed up with Francis, and then we fled Hollywood. And I was kind of on the fringes, but I was kind of making, you know, regular movies. I said, I want to make one that has, you know, big cameras and sound stages and all that stuff. But I live in San Francisco, and we didn't have any of the, you know, there's a huge infrastructure you need to do that. Well, to be very honest with you, down here, the studios mostly are filled with television. Mm. So it's very hard to get, you know, I needed like 11 sound stages. Mm. And it's like... They didn't have 11 sound stages down here to spare. They were all television. But London had great talent. They had great actors. Uh, they had, you know, a uh, plaster shop, mm -hmm. you know, which you don't see everywhere. They had good carpenters. They had, you know, do a film like this is really hard. So you needed the, all the craftsmen. Mm -hmm. And England, other than Hollywood, is the only place that really had, you know, first-rate craftsmen. Mm -hmm. And their industry was basically falling apart. And so the studios were sort of crumbling and they were selling them and they sold um, L Street, which is where I was, mm -hmm. and they turned it over from having a staff to having independent guys come in and work. And as a result, I was able to get you know, a great deal, mm -hmm. uh, save a lot of money, and uh, 
basically, that's always been my philosophy, is just to simply go anywhere in the world I can go where I can get the lowest price. <laughs> because my first three films, the first two were under a million, and this one was, you know, we did the budget, came out to 13 million. Laddie said, the board will never approve this, we can't do it, it has to be under 10. I said, I can't do it under 10. This is not a negotiated thing, this is like, which I'm sure everybody's gone through. You know, this is actually what it costs. Mm. You know, this is actually the, the price, you know, we worked it out. But they're so used to producers and people sort of ripping them off, they don't believe right. that there's actually a real thing behind it. <laughs> you know, there's actually a, that guy yeah. gets paid that much an hour, and he's <laughs> gotta work that many days, and that's what it's gonna cost you. Yeah. And I can't make any less. We gave a budget for $9,999,099. And I said, I don't think it'll come in at that, but we did it anyway, it came up $13 million. <laughs> uh, you know, because that was what it actually cost to do it. Right. Working in England, I mean, one of the things, you know, I've, I've made films in England, and uh, my experience there was very much that the, the crews, when you're starting out there, they're, they're very um, suspicious. They're very sort of like, okay, let's, let's see what you can do, see who you are. There's not a sort of, there's a, there's a bit of that wait and see, you know, what have you got kind of thing for, for a director over there. And I would imagine going there with, these crazy costumes and these crazy sets. There would have been a lot of skepticism, frankly. Well, there was. I have one question for you. Mm. Did you have an English accent when you went over there? Yeah. No, I picked up very quickly. Cause yes, I was going to say, <laughs> you sound like an Englishman. <laughs> of course they would say, oh, yeah, well, you were, you, you dress like an Englishman. I dress like an Englishman. <laughs> I sound like an Englishman. It doesn't help at all. It's, oh. about, <laughs> it's about what have you done before? And what are, you know, there's, a yeah, very, well, there's a very sort of like, okay. You can imagine what I went through. I had long yeah. hair. I had a beard. I was 29 years old. And their industry was sort of <laughs> crumbling a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I walked in there and I had this really crazy script, which <laughs> they all... You know, the, the entire crew was 100% against me, <laughs> except for the art department. They were the only guys that stuck right. by me through the whole movie. And it was horrible, horrible. They, in those days, they, uh, you worked really from uh, 8 in the morning until 5.30 at night, and that was it. Mm -hmm. You could not, unless the crew voted, you could not work past 5.30. Right. Wow. And, but you could take what they call the quarter. So if you were in the middle of a shot, you could actually finish that shot. They give you 15 minutes, you know, the mm -hmm. quarter to fi finish the shot. And then if you didn't get it done, they give you another 15 minutes and whatever. But they would, I was at a studio, they would basically at 5.30, they'd shut off, the, it was run on generators, they just flipped the switch. <laughs> and that was the end of it. And, you, you had to get the crew to vote. Well, the AD was way, way against me, the cameraman was way against me, and, when, and every time they would say no. No matter who, how the vote went, they'd always look to them first, they'd say no, and then everybody would vote no. Yeah. Except the art department would vote yes, but of course they were outnumbered. So I had to get it done at 5.30 every night. Wow. It was, you know, and that was the least of it, but that was, you know, they just, had no idea, and they were very, you know, they, they, they basically thought the film was stupid, which, you know, if you read it, it sort of reads kind of stupid, but, <laughs> and you know, and we had this big seven-foot thing walking around the set, and not, you know, and, and guys, you know, and green guys with long snouts, and, you know, they thought it was a very bad version of Doctor Who. <laughs> so... When you've got Darth Vader without James Earl Jones' voice, so you've got, I guess, Dave yeah. Krause doing the dialogue through home. Well, Probably not the same impact. You know. That was one of those things where, yeah, no, he had a very North, North, Northern England accent, which is <laughs> almost Cockney. It's just, you know, very, very thick and ridiculous uh, for, <laughs> you for know, Darth Vader. And he, uh, you know, I, I hired him because he was big. I just needed a big guy. Mm -hmm. And he was in Clockwork Orange, he was this giant guy, and I said, well, all right, this will work. So I needed somebody who was like, you know, close to, you know, like six foot seven-ish, mm -hmm. eight, nine there. And um, I always was gonna replace his void, I was gonna replace 
uh, Anthony Daniel's voice. I, all the people that you didn't see, I was going to replace their voices over mm -hmm. here with Americans. Because again, I was making an American film in England and most of my actors were English. Right. So except for the key people I brought over, and of course the, the uh, union wouldn't let them come in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did get in reasonably e easy on that movie, but when we went back to do Empire, they wouldn't let him in at all. Mm -hmm. I said, this is a sequel. <laughs> These are people that are in the other movie. We already hired them. They are the, there's only three American actors coming in on a movie with 250 actors. You're going to ha not have this movie come here because of that? <laughs> but anyway. Anyway. <laughs> well, it got done. And uh, so then you go back to the States and you see your, well, no shots from Ireland after a year's work right. and half the budget. Uh, presumably you panic a little bit or try not to. Well, it was worse than that. <laughs> um, I had shot the film. At the very end, uh, the only thing Laddie ever did do was, at the very end of shooting, I was uh, two weeks over schedule, and I was going to go another two weeks mm. to finish it, because I had to finish the whole beginning of the movie, you know, where they come into the ship and Darth Vader comes in, does all that stuff. Um, and I had to shoot that, and with R2, 3PO, and all this. And uh, he said, look, you've got to finish it. You've got to finish it in one week. And I said, but the whole, they haven't even finished building the set yet. He said, well, you've got to finish it in one week. I said, you know, I'll, I, I can do it, but it means everybody goes on overtime to build the set and to shoot it. And I'm going to have to have five crews, I mean, five four-second units. Mm. And that's going to cost you twice as much as you just give me the extra two weeks. And he said, I don't care. You've got to get it done. And this is where the reality of making movies comes in, which is later on, literally after I finished the movie and I started talking to members of the board and stuff, that I realized that the board had given him an ultimatum, that he'd have to go and face the board. This was in, with Fox. You know, he was the head of the studio, but he basically this, the, the board of directors was making every single decision. Of course, they were stockbrokers and people didn't know anything about movies. And they had given him multiple ways. You, and he was not going to, he said, you will not come back here to the board meeting, which is on Monday. I was going to be finished on Friday. He said, you will not come back here and have that movie still shooting. <laughs> wow. So he said, look, just get it done. So you got it done. But um, then I was cutting it together. I had an editor who I respected. He'd done some great movies. He'd worked for Richard Lester, who I admired. And, and I was an editor. And I was looking at this stuff and I said, God, I, this, I'm doing such a terrible job. This stuff is not going together. It's not working. It's terrible. What in the world is going on here? This is just, it's bad. So I went in on a weekend and I started recutting the movie myself. Mm. And I started looking. I said, well, and I could see that every cut I was making was like 12 frames off. Mm. Every, a lot of the angles and a lot of the performances were off. Mm. And I said, well, this isn't going to work. So I fired the editor. And this was about halfway through shooting. Mm. And I said, well, I'll just finish it when I get back because I'm not going to be able to hire another editor now and I only got another you know, six weeks and let's just get it over with. Mm. Came back here. I had no editors. I had to re... I immediately hired two assistants to put the whole movie back together in dailies. Wow. Just completely take the old work apart. Over. Put the trims back. Nothing. I had nothing. So I came wow. back. I had dailies. Wow. I had no special effects. <laughs> it was August. The movie was coming out in May. Mm. It sent me to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but so you know, did you go, I mean, with ILM, you went down there, you started really... I started going down twice and a week. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'd spend three days up north two days at LA, flying back and forth all the time. That was when the airline was PSA, which I don't know if anybody remembers that, it was probably before your time, but they had, you know, mm. PSA was an airline that flew like every half hour. <laughs> it was like a train, you know, and it was literally, you can see the posters, they still, if you do a period film, put a PSA poster, they had girls in miniskirts, but it was thirteen ninety five to get from San Francisco to LA. Wow. Excellent. Um, so those were the days. 
Now, I, I, I read somewhere, I don't know whether this is true or not, that, that ultimately with the, the visual effects as they went in, even at the end of, of everything, um, you were uh, somewhat dissatisfied, dissatisfied still. I was just curious about that because to those of us watching it, you know, and, and as everyone will see in a minute, you know, tonight, um, it's unbelievably uh, mind-blowing how great the visual effects are. Well, I fooled you. Actually, <laughs> in the end, I fooled myself because now that you can see it frame by frame mm. and everybody, you know, you can go on the Internet and there'll be a whole website devoted, devoted to one frame of the movie, <laughs> which has been analyzed six ways from Sunday. And I realized that it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Mm -hmm. And when I went to, you know, to do the special edition, mm. uh, which was we were going to re-release the picture, and I said... We discovered there was no print. Mm. The, the, we did a three strip in order to preserve it. They had, Fox had never bothered to strike a print because it was $50,000, so they never looked at it. So when I went to retrieve it from the salt mines, the cyan was completely out of sync with everything else. There was nothing to do about it. It was just worthless. Mm. So I had to go to Poland and Czechoslovakia and stuff and start putting things together and then making a digital master, you know, that where I could clean up the the uh, the dirt and the grain and the, all that stuff, and then uh, and I wanted to put back some of the things that I'd never been able. By that time, by Star Wars, I had gone back to American. I mean, I'd gone back to THX. The studio had cut five minutes out of the movie. Yeah. I said, I'm putting that. I went to them and I said, I want my five minutes back. <laughs> of course, this was before VHS, mm. but I just said, I want the film to be the way I originally intended the film to be. Mm. THX, it really didn't make any difference. I mean, it's like, for God's <laughs> sakes, it's so abstract. What, what difference is five minutes going to make? But American Graffiti, there were some very sort of, to me, pivotal scenes that they cut out. Mm. And just for the same reason that they cut out THX. Well, we can do it, so we will. Mm. And I was furious. And, you know, mm. Of course, nobody can come to your aid in a situation like that. You're basically screwed. And I was extremely pissed and bitter. And uh, so... Uh, but when I did uh, Star Wars, I came back and I said, I want my five minutes back. So I got my five minutes back in American Graffiti. Mm. So then when I uh, was moving along to, by this time I'd already done uh, Empire and stuff. This was sort of between the, before I decided to even do the prequels. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at the movies and I said, you know, I, it needs to be, I mean, we need to get a good print. So we looked and realized there was no good print available anywhere. So to preserve the film, for the possibility of a reissue, we started working on it. I said, well, I want to put the, the Jabba the Hutt scene back in because, mm -hmm. you know, I, basically, ILM, you know, we had to create the Jabba the Hutt part. Mm -hmm. And we just had a guy in a uh, furry vest because uh, at that point I thought he was going to be a furry Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was just too much for him. I mean, there's mm -hmm. no way they were going to get that finished. Right. And, you know, various other little, you know, mat, the uh, mat lines. <laughs> I want to get rid of all the mat lines because mm -hmm. I hated the mat lines. And digitally, we can get rid of them. So I said, you know, I'm going to make it the way I wanted it to be right. and the way I intended it to be. Um, so that's, you know, in the end, you want the movie to be the way you intended it. Mm -hmm. When I intended it, I had this vision of what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Well, from that day on, it just got compromised. Right. You know, in the script, in the... You know, cause the worst thing about being a writer is you can't blame anybody. You're the screw up. When once you get started and you shoot, you can say, "Well, it's the cameraman who was the thing, and mm -hmm. the thing, a studio," and you can sort of blame things on other people because you're under such duress or the the, the weather screwed you up. Mm. But when you get to the script, it's like, you know, and I wrote this giant script and I couldn't, you know, I was having all kinds of issues and problems developing it. And when I made it, and with ILM, and with everything else. Mm. Uh, you know, by the time I got done, I said, this is you know, like 25% of what I wanted. Well, let me ask this, because we have to wrap up now. And I, there's so many other things I wanted to talk about. I don't have time, like sound and all the groundbreaking things. Right. About, just so many. But um, people need to see the film and, and get going with that. But uh, well, I just want to... they Yeah, they won't <laughs> see it again. And I, I want to I ask one, one last thing, which is, at what point then, when you were editing the film, whatever, at what point, what screening was it where you finally realized this was going to work, this was going to be something special? I never realized it. Really? No. I 
finished it. And, you know, I was, again, I was completely exhausted. Three years of my life, blood, you know, and everything was going wrong all the time. And everything was sort of half of what I was hoping it would be. You know, it's like when you, you finish the day and you said, shit, that didn't go well. <laughs> you know? And then you cut it together and you say, well, maybe we can save it by doing this and maybe we can do it. So it was all like that. And uh, uh, I showed it an early version which still had all of the, the um, you know, World War II footage in it and everything, which I showed to uh, a bunch of my friends, which I'd done on all my movies. I invited them to come and see it. I mean, just, you know, a little screening at the house. And, uh, you know, there was like 12 of them, and they all, some of them were very vocal, like, oh, my God, what have you done? <laughs> uh, some of them were, by their personality, as in the kind of movies, they, this is, they're all directors right. and writers. So, you know, some of them that are a little hard were saying, what's all this force shit? You can't make a movie like that. For God's <laughs> sake, this is ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but he helped me, you know, I had a uh, roll up at the head that was about twice as long as it was. He said, you're never going to make that. Like, let me help you write a new roll up here. Right. Uh, so it, even though he was, you know, he makes horror movies. So he, he being Brian De Palma. Brian De Palma. Right. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, if you don't, you cut, some, name, if you don't right? cut somebody open and have blood splattering everywhere, he just thinks it's a <laughs> wussy film. Uh, and, uh, but he's a good friend and he really wanted it to work. The only one that believed in it was Steve Spielberg. He's what the only he one. Know, right? He's the one that said, "This is going to be the biggest film in the history of movies." And everybody looked at him like, "Are you out of your mind?" <laughs> he said, "No, I believe it. I'm telling you." And they all thought he was completely nuts, and I did too, actually. So I didn't believe anything he said. So in those days, stereo and monaural, where you had to do two separate mixes. Mm -hmm. um, so I had done the stereo mix, which is what it was first released on, and then I was busy doing the the monaural mix, I was just finishing it the night the movie came out. Hmm. Uh, and so I was, and I was working at night mm -hmm. over at Goldwyn. And I was, you know, mixing at night. And um, Laddie called me and said, it's a hit, it's a hit. You called me about 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. He said, it's a hit. My God, we sold out in every theater. This is fantastic. I said, Laddie, you guys have done uh, Planet of the Apes. You know that, sp that science fiction movies always do well in the first weekend. Because they're all the fans, I mean, they'll do it well. You know, it's not a hit until the fourth week. You call me on the fourth week and tell me it's working. <laughs> Excellent, and I'm sure he did. Um, we're gonna have to leave it there. George Lucas, thank you very much for coming to this. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.